I want to talk about science, but for those of you who are not scientists, um, you need not fear too much because I'm not going to go into deep science here. I'm going to talk mainly about heresy, heretics in science. And here's my title. Unfortunately, I, um, I posted the wrong title at the beginning. I just put um, causing trouble in the nicest possible way. So many of you might be coming to hear about my uh, fights in bar one or something. But um, <laughs> I realized that it wasn't very illustrative, this title. So I put on um, heresy, science heresy. OK, that's what I do. Um, obviously, I've come to inspiration a bit later than the previous speaker. Um, but um, I thank everybody for voting for me. Um, right, if you ask anybody who's not a scientist about science, um, they generally believe that science is a very open idea, that uh, scientists are very open to other people's work, that if a scientist comes up with new ideas, they immediately try to repeat the work. Everything's a wonderful rosy garden. Everybody's happy. And it's a, uh, a wonderful world of science. But in fact, the reality is, like every other aspect of life, um, science involves a lot of problems. And people, heretics, people who step outside uh, the norms of science, the paradigm, as we call it, tend to get into a lot of trouble. And um, all of these views here, in fact, uh, there are many examples of the opposite happening. The people, scientists who do come outside the norms, outside the establishment view, get into a lot of trouble. They can, in fact, be sacked. They can lose their jobs, even in universities. Um, so I want to talk about that a little bit and then go on to my own little heresies in science. Now, I've done a lot of kind of histor historical sociological work on these uh, many heretics. These are the ones I've tended to work on. Uh, you may have heard of some of these. You may not um, know of them. Jacques Benveniste, the first guy, Frenchman who worked on the so-called memory of water. The memory of water is uh, a bit like homeopathy, the idea that water retains a memory, and um, you can carry this memory of what substance was dissolved in it, and, and so on. And of course, this is very much heretical. It goes against modern science. Now, um, I'll come back to Jacques Benveniste in a minute. The other guy, Arvid Pushtai, um, did a lot of work saying that genetically modi food, modified foods uh, can be poisonous. He worked mainly with potatoes. And again, this was very much against the establishment. And he was um, made to retire at, his, uh, at the Rowett Institute in Scotland before his time. And again, uh, suffered very much for his heresy. Now remember, these are modern heretics. We're not talking about Galileo here. We're talking about people from the 1980s up to the present day. And uh, Peter Duesberg, the kind of heretics heretic, uh, Duesberg um, believes that HIV is not, does not cause AIDS. Now, you might think that all these people are stupid and don't know a great deal about science, but they are, in fact, bona fide scientists. In fact, they're leaders in their field. Duesberg was the leading uh, retrovirus expert in the world at the time when the AIDS epidemic started. Um, and of course, HIV is a retrovirus. So these people are not idiots. They're not at the fringe. They are bona fide expert scientists who are saying something that the establishment does not believe in. Now, the response to this, of course, is, well, maybe these people are all wrong. And, um, but I'm not interested in whether they're right or wrong. I'm interested in the response of the community to their heresies. And the response is violent and often very destructive to people like this. Now, you might think we live in a university with academic freedom, but there's a nice saying going around that academic freedom is there to protect, protect academics from their colleagues. And this is certainly true. Um, we think of academic freedom as being there to protect academics from government or whatever. But the reality is it's there to protect each of us from our colleagues. Because believe me, if you become a heretic, you find you have very little, very few friends um, in the academic world. Going back to Jacques Benveniste, uh, homeopathy, although he never actually linked um, his work with homeopathy. Here he is. I went to speak to him in Paris. Here he is with his uh, students. 
Jacques Benveniste, before he did a single experiment, was France's greatest scientist. He'd got the Legion of Honour, I think. He'd got all uh, <clears throat> the equivalents of knighthoods and fellowships of the Royal Society. And then he did one single experiment. And from then on, he was regarded as a heretic, an idiot, stupid, a cheat, um, from that single experiment. Now, even if the experiment was done wrong, done badly, and he, um, it's incorrect, the treatment that was meted out, out to him, he certainly did not deserve. Now, Jacques is very much of a fighter, or was, he recently died, and um, what he did was to stay put. They tried to fire him, but in France at the time, uh, if you had a job in the government, it was a job for life. They couldn't get rid of you, no matter what they tried. So they kicked him out of his laboratory, and hoped he wouldn't do any work, and keep quiet. But what he did was got some money from industry, and he put a porter cabin in the grounds of the institution, would you believe? And in this porter cabin, he continued to do his work until he died. So that's what happens when you become an extreme heretic. Uh, you see, you have to be very resourceful and do things um, out of the way. So, um, in my case, the kind of interest in the history and sociology of um, heretics has led me to kind of take a, a scientific approach to this. I tend to kind of do work that's uh, rather unusual at the edge of science rather than uh, the kind of work that gets grants these days. So I just want to go through three of these examples um, very quickly to talk about what I've done and what, what we've done as uh, a team in my laboratory. The first of these heresies is that uh, bacteria are a major cause of human cancers. Now, we tend to think of cancers as being caused by genes, maybe viruses. Um, of course, everything in biology is caused by genes, so we wouldn't expect uh, genes not to play a role. But what I've been working on for the last 20 years is the idea that bacteria cause cancer. Now, this does not mean that it's an infectious disease. I don't want you to go home and uh, worry about meeting someone who's got cancer, that you're going to catch it off them. You're not going to catch the disease off them. Um, but, it, we, but the theory goes that uh, these bacteria cause cancer. And this is very heretical. No one believes this, even though it's an idea that's been around for hundreds of years. In fact, every generation of microbiologists that comes around, um, there are people who find bacteria associated with cancer. And yet the idea is completely dismissed every time. Now, just quickly, cancer in the UK. Everyone's uh, scared of the big C. Here we have some uh, results, some comments about it. 1.2 million people in the UK living with cancer. 150,000 will die. Prostate cancer, breast cancer, very um, common. And we know that at least one bacterium, Helicobacter pylori, uh, is associated with cancer. It causes cancer of the stomach. Despite that finding, not many oncologists, not many experts on cancer will know about the role of bacteria in cancer. Now, as I say, it goes way back. In the 1920s, a man called Young, Professor James Young, uh, said that bacteria cause cancer by instigating inflammation. You get inflammation and cancer follows from it. Uh, again, his work was ignored. In fact, he was so vilified for this idea that he became a gynecologist. He moved from working on bacteria in cancer to become a gynecologist and become a very notable, uh, very famous gynecologist. So that's one way of in which you can avoid uh, attacks for heresy. You can move into a different subject and do something completely different. Now, one of the interesting things about the work of people like that was that, was that they said bacteria are pleomorphic. The bacteria that cause cancer occur in various shapes. And this makes life very difficult because we are used to bacteria being seen as single shapes. But James Young said that these bacteria could change their shape. Not only that, they could become very small and get inside the nucleus of the cancer cell. Now, we don't normally think of bacteria being small enough to get inside a nucleus. But here his work is saying they can get inside the nucleus. Once they're in the nucleus, they can cause damage to the DNA and cause cancer. So you can see the drift of where we're going with this. And here's some more work by some women scientists in the 1950s showing these very unusual shaped bacteria associated with cancers. Um, there was a, a group of women working on breast cancers. And we, had a, we have another kind of uh, complication here. Because these women, were, scientists were doing it in the 50s and 60s, uh, they were completely ignored because they were women. It was just sexism, total sexism. Their work was completely ignored. 
I had a man publish this work, I'm sure that they would be taken more seriously. Hopefully such things don't happen today, who knows. Now I've published on um, the idea that highly pleomorphic staphylococci, common bacteria, cause cancer. And we've done a lot of publications on this. I've sent this kind of work to at least 30 research establishments. I've never got a single reply saying thank you, that's very interesting, or maybe we'll look at it. Um, people will not, the establishment will not look at this idea. Here's some pictures of Helicobacter pylori, which causes stomach cancer, showing pleomorphism. There are different shapes. It normally occurs as a spiral organism, but here we see it occurring as a uh, coccoid, a round organism. And when we did some work, we did some work on dog mammary tumours, and we found, again, very strange. This is one organism, and yet you can see it occurs in different shapes. It occurs filamentously, it occurs here in this branch pattern, it occurs as a round ball and as a filament. Now, the problem with this is if you isolated this organism from four tumours, you might say it was four organisms. And this is what the establishment view would take of it, but it's in fact one single organism. So you can see how that would cause confusion. And here we have a look at it. This one looks like a fungus, it looks like a mould, penicillium. But when we look at it under the electron microscope, we see it's a bacterium. It's the same organism every time, it just appears in different ways. And this is what we call pleomorphism. And that's what causes the confusion, because people think they're looking at four organisms instead of one. Now, fortunately, there are a few people who are taking this idea more seriously, and we've got work here, very recent, this is uh, taken from two, 2014. Here's it's saying the bacteria cause uh, gum disease, which then cause cancers. And another one, cancer bacteria role in bowel cancer. So there is a, a move now towards taking this more seriously, but again, most oncologists, most, most experts don't know about this. None of the research councils have got a, a program of work looking at this. It's a complete heresy still. Um, one of my problems, one of our problems, is we can't get tumours. Because it's heresy, no one will give us tumours to work on. Um, I worked on dog tumours because a friend of mine who's a vet gave me these, and then all of a sudden he realised that maybe he was causing trouble, so he stopped providing me with tumours. So if anybody's got any tumours, please bring them along, because uh, I'd love to work on tumours. Heresy 2. It's not Darwin or Wallace's theory. I'm really getting to big deep water here. This is a, a historical work I've been working on. Uh, I'm going to go at Charles Darwin. Now, if you ever go at Charles Darwin today uh, in science, you're in big trouble. I am not attacking Darwin's work here. I'm attacking his contribution to the theory of evolution. Um, now, Darwin hype. Darwin's been subjected to more unscholarly hype than any other historical figure, I should imagine. He's been described as a genius, greatest thinker of all time. Isaac Newton, Beethoven, Mozart, whatever, uh, Einstein. Darwin is the greatest thinker of all time, apparently. And to many people, in fact, this is a quote from, um, from Dawkins, Richard Dawkins, who was the archdeacon of the religion of Darwin. Um, <laughs> Darwin is the father of modern thought. The father of modern thought. Wow. Amazing guy. So let's have a look at Darwin in more detail. In fact, if you look at what Darwin is supposed to have discovered, nothing in his famous book on the origin of species is novel to him. The famous um, Tree of Life, for example, was written many years before, some recent research showing this, um, by Lamarck, the famous uh, uh, sorry, uh, evolutionist who is often um, lampooned by the Darwinists. And yet he has this same picture here, I think about 40, 50 years earlier, than Darwin's picture. And yet Darwin is always given credit for the tree of life image. Now, it turns out that the most famous thing for which Darwin is credited with, which is the idea of natural selection, again, is not... Uh, unique to him. He did not come up with this idea. This, was, this idea was uh, originated at least 20 years before by another man called Patrick Matthew. Here's Darwin writing to Gray, a friend of his, in 1860, just after the origins had been published. And he says, have you noticed how completely I've been anticipated by Mr. Patrick Matthew in Gardner's Chronicle? That's a journal, uh, a nature journal, anticipated. He's been beaten to the idea of natural selection. 
And this is the idea that Darwin is supposed to have originated. He goes on, again to the same journal, I freely acknowledge that Mr. Matthew has anticipated in many years the explanation I have offered the origin of species in natural fiction. I can do no more than offer my apologies to Mr. Matthew for my entire ignorance of his work. So there's the uh, horse's mouth admitting that he did not come up with the idea of natural selection. And yet this is the central idea, it's Darwin's idea of natural selection. Um, now Matthew, it turns out, was a gentleman farmer, not a famer, uh, from Herrell near Dundee. I've given this lecture about 20 times and never noticed that. Um, he attended Edinburgh University, but like Darwin, didn't get a degree. And that's the only picture we have of him, and that's very little uh, detail we, we know about the man. And again, he... Um, Darwin writes to Patrick Matthew saying, I presume I have the pleasure of addressing the author of the work on naval architecture, this is a book he wrote, and the first enunciator of natural selection. How many times does Darwin have to admit he didn't come up with this idea uh, before people believe it? Now note, this is not my, my word. These are not my words, these are Darwin's words. They've been in the literature ever since 1860. Why haven't historians looked at it? Why haven't historians published it? I don't know. There seems to be this Darwin worship that anything to do with Darwin is kept very quiet. In fact, if you try and publish this work, you'll get um, a conspiracy of silence. People, the, the, the journals, the editors, will not respond. They send it back, um, not with any comments, but just rejected. No one will believe it. It's not just my work. Uh, other people have tried to get similar work published and there's a cons complete block on anything, any criticism of Charles Darwin. Now, of course, no one can deny the impact of Darwin's book and his later books. Um, but none of his ideas are actually uh, novel. What he does is he collects all the ideas together and puts them into a, a very cohesive book. He formulates a good theory, but he doesn't come up with the ideas. Now, a lot of people say, OK, that's... That's fine, we'll accept that, and that can be accepted with no problem. But the point is that he's not novel with these ideas. Not like Einstein, not like Newton. Even his wife uh, gets in on the act, Emma Darwin. She writes to uh, Patrick Matthew. Uh, Pat Matthew was changing his opinion of evolution, and she very uh, strongly berates him by saying, Darwin is more faithful to your own original child than you are. You've got to stop doing this. Uh, you're ruining the idea by deviating from it. So um, even Mrs. Darwin admits that Darwin did not come up with the idea of natural selection. So how can we view Darwin? How should we view Darwin? We should stop all this hype that you get on the telly, all this hype from uh, Dawkins and various other people. And we should view him as a naturalist who reviewed the available literature. He goes through all the literature, he brings it together. He was neither a genius nor one of the greatest thinkers of all time. But of course, his book did change the world. And if you're interested in this, you can search Google for my name, and all the, the details are laid out there. So that's a kind of a version of heresy in relation to history. Now, I didn't like doing this, of course, because I didn't come across this work until I was 59, some five years ago. I, as a student, all biology students are the same. We tend to have pictures like this on our wall. We tend to view Darwin as our great uh, leader, the, the, the main thinker in biology. And I think this is one of the reasons why people find it very difficult to take the facts, the truth, uh, about Darwin. Um, a Soviet biologist um, <clears throat> once said that uh, when I was in Soviet Union, I could criticize Darwin, but not the government. When he moved to the US, he could criticize the government, but not Darwin. And this is true even now. People who criticize Darwin are in for big trouble. So ironically, biologists have turned Darwin into a demigod. Uh, most biologists involved in this evolution are atheists, and yet they've created their own little demigod in Darwin. All this is shocking to you, I know. Uh, we shouldn't be talking like this. Imagine how the students respond to these kind of lectures when I tell them that Darwin is not what we expect him to be. Right, I'm going through this very quickly. Um, my final heresy is heresy three. Bacteria continue to arrive on Earth from space. Wow, this one's getting, I'm getting dafter by the minute. 
I've got an attack on cancer, I've had an attack on Darwin. Now I'm saying that microbes, life comes to Earth uh, from space at this very minute. So what I'm saying is when you go outside the, the door of this building, uh, microorganisms from space will be falling on your head. Okay, so by now you're thinking, well, let's get the, uh, let's get the psychiatrist out for this guy. But I'll show you some evidence to demonstrate this. Now, this, um, the modern version of this idea, called panspermia, is by, was, was, was set up by Fred Hoyle here and my friend, who's still alive, Chandra Wickramasinghe. Fred Hoyle was a famous, he recently died about uh, 10 years ago, uh, a famous um, mathematician, astronomer, and writer. He was a very famous science fiction writer. Anybody who's read uh, The Black Cloud or A for Andromeda, you'll know that he's a great science fiction writer, but also a great scientist. Now, it's generally reckoned that Fred Hoyle would have got a Nobel Prize if he hadn't got involved in this idea that life came from space and con con continues to come from space. That that was why he was denied a Nobel Prize. Plus, he was a very major critic of evolution. Two big heresies that people didn't like, and this was why he wasn't given a Nobel Prize. Chandra from Ceylon is very much still alive, he's retired, and together they come up with this, a modern idea of what we call panspermia. Now, there's two versions. Life originated from space. We call that panspermia. And then the new version, that life is coming from space at this very moment, we call a word I coined, neopanspermia. New panspermia. So uh, we worked on this from 2000, but last summer we had an amazing um, Stroke of luck. I had an amazing stroke of luck. I learned about these two students in engineering, Alex Baker and Chris Jones. Chris Jones, Alex Baker. And um, these are amazingly bright engineering students. And what they've done is they formed a company uh, sending balloons into the stratosphere. And the idea is that if you want to send um, a, a video to your loved one saying, will you marry me? or you want to send a birthday or a mother's card, instead of sending a card, you send a video. And this video is an image taken in the stratosphere. And people will pay a couple hundred quid to do this, apparently. So they form this business. So I got in touch with them. We had a discussion. I said, can you make a sampler to sample the stratosphere for microorganisms? We'd done this before with very expensive systems, and, and we'd, uh, we'd found microbes in the stratosphere. But I wanted to do it uh, on a more cheap basis. The ones that we, uh, we the, the, the launches we used before were one million quid. We can now launch to the stratosphere for about 1,500 pounds. So I've got 10 launches set up for a mere 17,000 uh, 17, pounds. And the basis of this is a box goes up on a balloon at, and a, a CD drawer opens and then the particles drop onto these little stubs. These stubs are then put into a very powerful microscope, an electron microscope, and um, we see what we find. The idea is if we go to 27 and 41 kilometers, if we pick anything up, it's coming from space, not from Earth. You've got to imagine, you've got to think of how high we're talking about. 27, 30 kilometers. Uh, that's about four times, well, 40 kilometers, about four times the height of a normal aeroplane. So the plane has to take off, take off, take off, take off. So you can see how high we're talking when we sample at these heights. Um, so is there life coming in then? OK, so what did we find? Here's one of the organisms we found on the stub, very powerful microscope. Um, I knew this was going to get the response it did. The sun called it the todger from space, the little green manhood from space. OK, I knew that was going to happen. I said to the press release lady in the, uh, in the university, the sun will not miss an opportunity to call this the todger from space. So it looks very erotic, um, as you can see. Uh, nothing much like this we, we know about on Earth. Doesn't mean a great deal, because of course we, it might be on Earth, but we, don't, uh, we haven't found it yet. But it looks very unusual. It's certainly biological. You've got what looks like a, a proboscis here, a bent proboscis with a, what looks like a nose. You've got a sphincter here. This looks like a bit like an ear. Maybe it's a, a, um, a structure for, for motion. It's, it vibrates and moves the organism around. So this organism was captured at 30 kilometers, around 30 kilometers, 27 kilometers, in the atmosphere, in the stratosphere. 
And there's a, a close-up of the nose, very nose-like, and here's the sphincter. So you might imagine this takes stuff in and this ejects it, or maybe it's the other way around. But it's clearly biological, it's not a piece of fluff, as some of the uh, internet trolls have suggested. Another thing we found was this unusual structure. Um, it is, in fact, uh, part of a diatom. Diatoms occur in the oceans, and this is a, a little bit of it. It's, um, if you imagine that it continues both, this is a fragment, and inside here we would have had an alga, a green organism. The organism has gone, but we're left with this diatom here. And again, we've got this from the height of 27 kilometers. Here's another mass of unusual beasts. Uh, we've got one here that looks like a shield. Uh, we've got one here that looks like a bit like a bone. This one here, like a donut, I suppose. And uh, they're all clumped together. And we think these are coming in from space. So these could potentially land on you as you walk out the, uh, the, the building. Here's another one, very unusual. We can't really work out what that looks like. But very importantly, this one's got little holes here, which look like breathing holes you might find in plants or insects. But you can see, very importantly, this thing has caused some damage to the, the structure of the, um, the sampler. Now, what we think is happening is that this is coming in from space at speed. And when it hits the stub, it causes damage there and there. So this means that it's not lazily coming up from Earth. It's coming down uh, at speed from space, hitting our sampler. So that's very good evidence that this thing is coming in from space. Now, the, the most amazing uh, structure we found in our samples was this thing here. This uh, is a, a sphere which is made of the metal titanium. Now, you might think it's just a piece of titanium um, waste from, from Earth, maybe a bit of uh, pollution particles from a, a coal-fired coal, uh, power station. But when we look at it in more detail, what we find is that It's got biological entities inside it. What we've done is we've taken the particle and using this little needle here, which is bent as we've done it, you've got to remember we're talking about 10 microns. This is extremely small, smaller than the human hair. And when we move the particle across, you can see that this stuff comes out. And we know this is biological. Um, it's coming out of here. And you can see here there's also a crater. So this thing has caused a crater on the, the stub and there's biology coming out of it. So it's a titanium sphere with an organism inside. And this is coming from space at speed, impacting the, crater, impacting the sampler, causing a crater. Now there's more. There's more. If we uh, look at the surface, this is a close-up of what's happened. That's the stuff issuing out as we moved it. There's the crater. And this is stuff is uh, the surface of this titanium sphere. If we look at this in more detail, um, we find that, amazingly, it is filamentous. It looks like a fungus or a filamentous microorganism. It looks a bit like, I don't know if your mother or your granny still does this, but when I was a kid, my mother used to pull out jumpers, and you pull out a thread, uh, and all this is like knitted, if you can see, and when you pull out the thread, it, it comes away. And this is the thing in high power. Because it's extremely high power, we're losing a bit of definition, but you can see it's branching like a tree. So these filaments, we think, pretty certainly are biological, and they're on the end of this sphere. So again, we think this is proof that there's life coming from somewhere, impacting the Earth as we speak. Um, and we're sending more launches up uh, in the next few months. To think. Now, when we published this, um, we got a lot of trolling on the internet. I mention this because um, it's, a, it's a, a modern problem with modern life. The internet's great, because you can put your work on it, you can find look at Google Books and all kinds of things, you can use it very productively. But unfortunately, there are nasty people on it called trolls, and here they are, who, as you know, they uh, dismiss everything that anybody tries to do, often in very violent uh, language. There's an old saying that the only thing interesting about an internet site is how long it takes for the F word to appear. <laughs> and when we're talking about this work, it was pretty quick. Um, that's me smiling, my friends smiling at these trolls. Um, these trolls, I call them bedsit Einsteins. They know very little. You don't have to know anything to put your opinion on the internet. And they say amazingly stupid things like, this guy's an idiot because there's no water on comets. Well, all they have to do is go to Google, put water, comets, and they, they will find out that there is water on comets. So 
we, we try to avoid all this because it's not worth reading generally. I mean, if it's really useful scientific debate, that's great. We would love to know where we're going wrong if that's the case. But this trolling is amazing. And one of the things that they really trolled about was the journal we published the work in was not peer reviewed. Now, peer review, of course, to a scientist is, is very important, except if you work for Harvard. Because you'll, you might have noticed that this latest work on the Big Bang was released at a press conference and the work was never published nor peer reviewed. So it seems like Harvard can get away with things that Sheffield scientists can't. But in reality, the work was peer reviewed. Um, these, people, these trollers were just telling lies. And just, I'm not bragging about this, just to show that this Journal of Cosmology was peer reviewed. Uh, this is the biological reviewer's comment. There was a space reviewer's comment. This paper has been thoughtfully written, etc., etc. But basically, it says that this is a scientific study. It is not a load of rubbish. It's not sci fi, UFO, and so on and so forth about little green men. So um, I put that up just to show you that we hope the work can be taken seriously and people in the future will repeat it. But if it's true, imagine how important this is. There's life coming down from space. Life has always come down from space. The origin of life on Earth was, we think, that there was nothing and life from space came. As soon as the conditions came right for life to appear on the Earth, it had been coming down forever and ever. And at that moment when it became acceptable for life, life took off. And it's continued to come in because nothing has changed. And one of the problems with biologists is they, f they forget that the planet Earth is an open system. They think it's like a greenhouse, like the Eden Project, which is separated from the cosmos, but it's not. We know the sun comes in, of course. We know that maybe um, meteorites, asteroids, destroyed the, um, the dinosaurs. There's always impact events on Earth. Earth is linked to the cosmos. It is not separated from the rest of space. So, heresy number three, then, um, is that life is continuing to come in. And we think it comes from comets. We think comets are flying around the cosmos, picking up life, and they're, um, they're multiplying it and then spewing it out at the back. And these are the uh, harbingers of life. As in fact, from historical records, uh, way back into the Middle Ages, people have regarded comets as the, uh, the deliverer of disease, infections, and so on. Um, they've always been linked with death and destruction. So we think that the life is coming from these, it's, the comet breaks up, the material is um, sent out, and it comes in little ice crystals. The, the organisms are um, naked, they're in an ice crystal, and the ice crystal impacts the sampler and causes the damage. Nearly getting there. Um, so, when you go out there, get yourself an umbrella, protect yourself from this stuff coming in. Uh, here I am in the quad, protecting myself from these beasts from the stratosphere. We've not seen anything like that. That's not a scientific paper. There's some, just some, uh, some pictures I could find, or some uh, little shapes I could find on the internet. Right, causing trouble in the nicest possible way then. Most scientists don't cause trouble. They're com particularly these days, they're happy to get grants, they're happy to work in the paradigm my advice to any young scientist is if you've, unless you've got a very thick skin and you, you uh, want to avoid trouble, uh, sorry, yeah, if you want to avoid trouble, make sure you work within a paradigm, find yourself a little enzyme, work on it, get yourself a fellowship of the Royal Society, big grants, professor this, professor that, and get yourself uh, a knighthood and be happy ever after. Whatever you do, do not go into heresy unless you're prepared for what might happen. And as I said in the beginning of this talk, what might happen is you get sacked, you get vilified in the press, etc., etc. You certainly get vilified by the trolls on the internet, and you could end up without a career, your wife and children destitute, and uh, you work in, uh, in McDonald's just because you came up with a new idea that the scientific establishment didn't like. So don't believe all the university crap about... We believe in new ideas going forward. We are blue skies. The fact is, if they want to get you, they will. This is not paranoia. This is fact. Particularly if you do research which involves money. So, for example, if I said, if I'd got research that saying HIV does not cause AIDS, then the pharmaceutical companies would get on 
the people who are making AZT, for example, would get onto the vice chancellor and say, that guy's got to go. We're losing money. They wouldn't say we're losing money in reality. What they would say is, he's killing people. Millions of people are dying because he's saying this. Is, and, and by the way, I'm not saying that. <laughs> Don't get me sacked. But um, you can see my, my drift. And the vice chancellor would say, let's get rid of this guy, not because his science is wrong, but because he's killing people. Now imagine what, if that view was taken with thalidomide. I don't know if it was, I'd like to check up on that. But imagine if a scientist was shut up about thalidomide and we got all those poor kids with no limbs. So it's very important that we listen to heretics. Heretics are not stupid people, they are scientists who deviate from the norm. And another idea that often comes up is this idea that the consensus view, right? If everybody thinks the same, all the scientists come up with the same ideas, it must be right. Well, his history shows on a number of occasions the scientists have been wrong and a lone individual has been right. Often they die before their, <laughs> before their, uh, their work is uh, recognised and probably this will happen with me. I'll be long gone before people say that life is coming from space. Maybe one day it'll appear in your, uh, your textbooks, your first year textbooks, and everybody will say it's obvious and they'll forget all the hard work and attacks that people like myself did to get this uh, ideas there. The only problem with this is you can appear paranoid, right? <laughs> um, and people say to you, well, you know, you're mad. The world is very nice. What's wrong with you? You are causing trouble. You deserve all you get. My wife tells me this. Um, <laughs> But I finished off with a nice, wonderful ending. Everything is all well, oh, ends well. It's a wonderful and exciting privilege to be able to think and work at the edge. It really is. Why would you work on a, on a little enzyme if you could work on something like this? I mean, I can't understand it. Um, interestingly, one last comment. I could talk for England, of course. I can go on forever. But um, one last comment. When I got involved with Chandra, with Kramasinghe about this, um, he was being vilified, and I wrote a little letter to um, the journal that was attacking him and defending him, and I got an email from Chandra saying, would you like to come and work with us? Would I like to come and work with you on the origin of life and space? And it turned out that everybody else he'd contact, every other microbiologist, wouldn't get involved because of their grants and their job, their careers. Well, since I've never had either, I was quite happy to join in, so I joined in, and as you can see now, as a biologist, I'm a, a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society. I'm a, a stargazer. I know nothing about stars. If you ask me to point out the plough, I could probably just about do it, but I've got the, uh, the honour of a fellowship because of my interest in, in biology in space. So there it is. Um, work on the edge of science if you want, but be very careful. It's a jungle out there, okay? Thank you very much.